we will talk about your, your journey, of course, as a Christian rapper. But before that, uh, you went by the name of Easy, if I'm saying it correctly, and you were also a secular rapper. While you were a secular rapper, you released some songs with people like Christoph and so on and so forth. And now you yeah. go by the name of Preacher Man. So why Preacher yeah. Man? Uh, Preacher Man, uh, after God delivered me from my past, uh, I knew that I knew that uh, uh, I was I was going to face being bullied by my friends because uh, out in the streets I was the one to have like that that cost. If uh, if my friends were doing one, I had to go two, three, four. So uh, 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 seeing myself picking up a Bible and then uh, talking about God, going to church, I knew that I was going to I was going to be called some kind of church name like men of god pastor and they was going to be calling me like that to bully me to to make me feel uh ashamed of my faith so uh i was asking god what can i do how can i face this and then i was listening to a song the name actually came from a song mm -hmm. uh so i'm listening to, i'm listening to this song and in the song and the song literally says i used to want to be a dope dealer and now the who is calling me preacher me. So when I heard that when I heard that line in the song, that was that was it. Yeah, I just I just had a strong conviction that wow, uh, I think I'm going to call myself preacher me. And when my friends are calling me pastor, man of God, it's already my name. So it's not going to move me. That was how I adopted the name preacher me. Let's talk a little exactly. bit about your childhood because you grew up in a in a Christian family, very uniquely. Sure. One of few people both of your parents were uh, pastors how did that shape your childhood into and how different uh, was that compared to other children growing up uh, uh, in a in a Christian home with both your parents being pastors uh, the expectation is so high uh, people 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 expect you to to have a certain moral standard people people uh, people expect you to automatically uh, uh, reflect the message of your parents. Uh, people expect you to be like that. Uh, that yardstick for for discipline, that yardstick for for morality. So uh, 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 the 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 pressure on me was was so was so much. It was it was really hard. And my parents really did their best in bringing me up in the fear of God. Like growing up, there's not a time. In my childhood, that I can remember secular music being played in my house. Uh, I woke up to I woke up to programs on radio ERW like uh, On Shackle, uh, Back to the Bible, Guidelines. Those were strictly all Christian program. The only station I used to play in my house as a kid was a uh, uh, On Shackle. There was something that I, I I knew we had in my home in my family that I did not see in others uh, uh, around me. There was a level of peace. I was aware of that. My home was very peaceful. The home was very peaceful. I never saw my dad raising his voice and my mom. I never saw my dad abusing my mom. I never saw my parents uh, uh, fight. I, I know that parents have their own uh, uh, issues, but I never saw it one day. So uh, uh, that, was, that, was, that was my childhood, but man, uh, uh there was always this this rebel in me uh because people expected that high moral standards from me and i could not find myself to meet it i was i was always the one breaking the rules and um it's very powerful when you say that people expect and use pastors children uh, to be the yardstick of morality, to be the yardstick of the high standards. And I can only imagine the type of pressure that creates mm. for the children. So throughout your childhood, some of the things that you, um, you, you had issues with was low self-esteem. And also, like you mentioned right now, losing your sister, those had tremendous impact on you mentally. And one of the True. ways that you try to cope with that is by utilizing drugs. So how long were you in the ghetto, um, you know, trying to cope and find meaning in, in life? by utilizing drugs? How long were you just in that setting until things changed for the better? Uh, I would say over a period of 10 years. Yeah, because uh, when when my wow. sister passed, I, I was going to school, 
I was going to school, reserve people like regularly students with students with students would go to school in the morning, but I was going to school, <laughs> I would mix with the, with the crowd, like after reset, I would leave my house in the morning and I would go in the theater and I would spend time there just to be among the numbers, like mix with the children after after reset and go to class and sleep all through and and and, and just come back home. So putting the years together, it was, yeah, a little, a little over 10 years, like the, the struggle with the addiction. It was quite it was quite some time 10 years wow that's crazy that's a whole generation i'm telling you <laughs> that and was that's when people really that was start to believe that this is who you are there will be no more change in you there will be nothing sure. good to come out of you because you've been doing it for so long 10 years most people don't do anything in the state permitted to wait for 10 years so when you go the so negative long. way you do it for 10 years people start to not even believe that it's possible to to bring it back but here you are You've been fully rejuvenated. But I want you to sure. tell us a little bit about some of the instances or encounters that you had um, that you know, brought you out of the, the ghetto specifically. So like, you know, you said, you you know, there was a time where you, know, you were healing and you try to go to church. There was this one time you wanted to go back to the ghetto to actually smoke. But then when you got there, you had an encounter with somebody else. <laughs> so you want to share that story because I think it's such a powerful True. story that people need to hear. Like sometimes we think we're doing, we're achieving our selfish motives. But God has other plans for us, and we have no idea. So just share a little bit of that with us. True. One day, um, sitting in the ghetto, um, um, uh, uh, before that time, I had a, I had a, I had an encounter with God for real. That night, I remember that it was a Sunday. <laughs> it was a Sunday. I still remember like yesterday. I did not, for some reason, this Saturday night before the Sunday, I was so, I was so high. I did not know how I got home because. I was telling somebody whenever I had money, like I was, my consumption level was about two. And if you win the streets, you know what two is, then you know what, what I'm talking about. And when I'm broke, it's about grand or half grand. So I had money in that time, and I was so, I was so hot. So I went home that Saturday and I slept all day. Sunday, I could not find the strength to get out of bed and go in the street to get a fix. Now that I did not have money, I had money, but I could not. So when the time reached that the drug that I had consumed had left my body, it was like I was in the trance. It was in the night. I did not know I was, I was in the trance. I saw myself standing over myself. And I saw my friends then fighting over me. And it was at that moment that I really had my first real encounter with God. And I saw a Bible and I saw an envelope. I did not know what was in the envelope, but I knew. I did not see what was in it, but I knew it was it contained money. And a voice told me to choose. And it was reluctant. It was as if my hand, my hands was empowered to, to, to choose the Bible. But when I lay my hands on the Bible, I saw myself back in my body and I shouted. After that encounter, I got sick at the point of death. They had to tow me from the street and carry me back home. I will be taking medication, and the moment my parents gave me small chains, I will remove the trip from my hands and I will crawl my way back in the ghetto. And God kept me alive. So after that encounter, I knew now that I had to get out. I knew that I knew that I was tired. It was after that encounter that I started to cry out to God in my heart. I started to tell God that if you're real, this is what I, I need you to do to prove to me, my son, I need you to take this thing out of me. I know that I'm way far gone and I can't help myself. If you're real, you want to step in and take this thing out of me. It was not instantaneous. It was over a period of a year. I would be crying. And during those, uh, uh, those times, I'll be in the ghetto. I'll be smoking the substance. And I'll be speaking against it. My friends used to be like, my man, you, you smoking and you talking, say you will eat, you will eat the thing. Like I did poogie here. You will eat drug. You will be, you will let it in. Right. And I'll be, I'll be, I'll be <laughs> smoking, <laughs> I'll be smoking, and I'm talking against the substance. I'm talking against it. When I see, when I see another young man who is just coming on the substance, I'll be angry with them. I'll be talking to them. And I'm thinking, you know what you're getting, you, you know what you're getting yourself into. And they will tell me, say, if you bow, then you don't it. Right. Yeah. If you, if you bow, why you can leave it? Those words used to help me, and I used to take it as a challenge. So during those times, man, I would be speaking out, and I will be like aggressive with the Nigerian guys, and 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 the deed they happen. So 
So that morning, I'm seated in the ghetto, man, and this madman walks in the ghetto. He passed by all, and he goes to the dumb side. And he turns, and he pointed to me. He just said, you. And then my attention went on him. <laughs> and he laughed. He said, what are you doing here? Man, that was, that was it. Those words, those words carry, carry conviction that, 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 that broke my heart. And I was like, wow, if this, if this madman, that me they may talking to, it didn't mean, can look at me and ask me what I'm doing here, it means that I'm misplaced. That was it for me. I woke up that morning and I went back home. I went on the road, tried to get a bike, like no, no bike wants to carry me because they don't want to carry all we can fit. So I was sitting beside the road first, <laughs> true. <laughs> the first time, <laughs> they know we can pay. The first time God showed me was uh, <laughs> a full of national. He came and he stopped and he said, he said, friend, he said, let me carry you, let's go. And I got on, on his bike and that guy carried me straight to my house. I did not have any money on me. That full of man carried me straight to my house and then he put me down. My mom, it was in the day, it was in the morning hours. My mom was on the back porch and she asked me one question. She said, you not come on now? And I told her, I said, people the full of me, people the people the people the man for me. <laughs> and, I walked, and I went and I went in my room. <laughs> and I cried. And I cried. I remember just crying. I, I had not, I had not, I had not, like the way I felt, I had not. I had not experienced that for a long time. I feel alive for with all the with all the withdrawal symptoms and everything in that moment. Like I was just like, God, this is it. Like you can't you can't speak to me more than this.